Hey guys, I figured that this episode probably needed another intro. I know most of you are probably sick of them now, but I think it was uh, worth it or needed for this one at least. Um, I don't really like paranormal stories. I don't like ghost stories. I don't like this theme at all. I'm going to be totally transparent and honest with you because good stories or good ghost stories, paranormal stories are super, super hard to find. I feel like 1% of them are believable believable and good and interesting and that's just me uh, i know there's a very small percentage of people who like ghost stories paranormal stories and i don't really do them very often on this channel so if that's one of you who's been constantly requesting them this is for you because i know most people aren't going to like these stories and they're not going to like ghost stories they don't like paranormal stories because they all kind of sound the same but to those who want them, I hope these are good. I hope you enjoy these stories. I really, really highly doubt I'll probably do another ghost or paranormal stories for a long, long time after this because no offense, they just don't hit like I want them to. And that's just me. I know I'm kind of picky when it comes to stories and themes and stuff like that, but I like what I like. Hopefully you enjoy them. And next episode will be on Thursday and I can't remember what the theme is, but I'll see you then. Cheers. My grandmother used to tell me stories when I was a child, especially on nights when the wind howled through the trees outside, or when a storm would roll in, making our lights flicker. It was her way of entertaining me, I suppose, or maybe she just liked seeing me squirm. But there was one story, one that stuck with me all of my life, long after she'd passed and her voice was just a memory. It was my favorite when I was younger, but as I got older, I understood it was more than just a bedtime tale. It was something darker, something seriously weird. This story had lingered in our family for decades. She would sit me down in that quiet, almost whispery tone that she would say for moments like this, and she'd always start with, I was just a girl during the war. Now, I think when I was a kid, I believed this was a story that she'd gotten from some book. That's how wild it was and out there it was. I thought she was just pretending that it happened to her, then added a little extra edge to the narrative. It was only after I became an adult and began reading for myself, learning for myself, and talking to people on my own, that I would share this story. And nobody had ever heard anything like it. It turned out it really did belong to her and it wasn't something she heard by the fire or read in the library. She was a kid when World War II was going on, when the factories were humming. The air was thick with that kind of uncertainty that only war can bring. She lived in a suburb, the kind where everybody knew each other's business, where news traveled very fast, and tragedy even faster. That was the world that she grew up in. Flags on every single corner, and folks constantly getting word their sons or brothers had been gunned down overseas. When she wasn't at school, she worked as a babysitter for a family down the street. Deborah was the mother, a hardworking woman who'd found herself at a local factory, making parts for the war effort. Her husband, Stephen, had been drafted, and while he was off somewhere in Europe fighting, Deborah was left to raise their young daughter, Marin, all alone. Marin was five, maybe six at the time. A sweet little girl, my grandmother said, always polite, always with a smile that could light up a room. It was the kind of innocence that reminded everybody of a simpler time, before the war, before everything had turned so grim. Margaret, my mother, grew close to Marin over time. She was practically family at some point, spending most mornings and afternoons with the girl while Deborah worked her long shifts at the factory. They played games, read stories, and for the most part, life was uneventful quiet in a way that everybody secretly feared would end at any moment, just a bomb away. Things didn't change with the bomb though, it was even worse. My grandma told me that the first sign something was wrong happened on a bitter cold day in late November. She'd gone over to babysit per usual, but the moment she walked through the door, Marin was different. She threw a tantrum about the most trivial things, her dress being too tight the light in the kitchen being too bright. She lashed out at my grandmother, screaming, crying, even hurling insults, which was completely out of character for that little girl. 
My grandmother, who was now baffled and a bit frightened by the outburst, tried to calm her down, but nothing seemed to work. Marin went on about the lights, even the sun from the outside. Everything was too bright. One look at her eyes and you knew she wasn't lying. They were dilated, beyond disbelief, almost totally black. My grandmother tried to make it as dark as possible, but nothing seemed to please the child. And then when Deborah came home later that day, her face was ashen, eyes hollow, as if she aged years in just a few hours. That was when my grandmother learned the news. Deborah had received a call that afternoon, a devastating one. Her brother, who'd been fighting in France, had been killed in action. My employer was the last one to receive that tragic news from the war front. Marin didn't know. Nobody had told her. She was far too young, too fragile for such a conversation. Yet, her behavior had changed the exact moment Deborah had gotten that call. My grandma said they found it very strange, uncanny even, but life was filled with coincidences, was it not? They pushed it aside, and my grandmother offered her condolences, quietly leaving the house to give Deborah her space. But deep down, she said, something was gnawing at her, a feeling that there was more going on than anybody could actually see. In the days that followed, Marin's behavior only got worse. It wasn't just the tantrums anymore. She'd fly into fits of rage, screaming at the top of her lungs, pounding her fists into the floor until her knuckles were raw. She began talking about things, dark, horrific things. She began mentioning places that she would have no way of talking about, knowing about, described bombed out villages and soldiers dying in the fields. Her voice would drop to a growl when she spoke, her eyes rolling back as if she was channeling something not of this world. The worst part, my grandmother said was that her words lined up perfectly with what they later learned in the news. Each time, the casualty numbers rose and rose. Each time a new battle was reported, Marin's strange fits would grow more and more intense. The townspeople began to talk. Whispers of possession floated around like the wind of ash. Children sang nursery rhymes about her, making the rumors worse. Deborah was beside herself. She started keeping Marin inside locking all her doors, drawing the curtains, trying to shield herself from the world as best she could. But it didn't stop. It never stopped. My grandma would still come over when Deborah needed a break, though these visits were fewer and far between. She told me about one afternoon when she was in the kitchen washing dishes while Deborah took a nap on the couch, utterly exhausted. Marin had been quietly playing in a room, or so my grandma thought. That's when she heard a noise, a low, haunting tone floating through the house. She followed the sound to the living room, where she found Marin sitting at the family piano. Marin's tiny hands danced across the keys, playing a piece my grandma had never even heard before. Something complex, something classical, far beyond the abilities of a child who had never touched an instrument in her life. As she continued to play, she began to sing in a voice that was not her own. It was deeper, older. The song itself was in a language my grandmother didn't even understand at first. Then she realized it was Italian. An opera, maybe, but the words were unfamiliar, foreign. And the melody itself sent a chill down her spine. Worse still, Marin did not blink the entire time she played. Her eyes locked on my grandmother with this intensity that made her stomach turn. She had this weird smile dancing at the edges of her lips. It was as if she knew what she was doing was unnatural. Deborah woke up halfway through and ran into the room, screaming at Marin to stop, to snap out of it. But the girl just continued to smile, her fingers gliding over the keys, her voice echoing off the walls. In fact, when Deborah asked her to stop, Marin sang even louder. My grandmother thought that the walls would surely crack. They managed to pull her away from the piano, but the damage was done. My grandma said the air in the house felt different after that. Heavy was something that did not belong. The stories continued to spread. Neighbors claimed Marin could predict the future. She knew things no child should. Deborah stopped sending her outside altogether, kept her locked inside of her room almost like a prisoner. My grandma, now terrified but still feeling a sense of duty, continued to visit, though each time she left the house, 
she swore she could feel eyes on her, following her, watching her every move. And then came the night, the night that everything changed. My mother said she'd gone over to check on Debra, who was barely holding it together. Marin had been locked up in a room all day. The house was eerily quiet, too quiet. As my grandmother cleaned up the kitchen, she heard a door creak upstairs. At first, she thought really nothing of it. Maybe Deborah had gone upstairs to check on Marin. But when she glanced up the stairs, she saw something. Marin was atop the staircase, holding something in her hand. It glinted in the dim light, a razor blade. My grandmother screamed for Deborah, but before she could move, Marin slowly began walking down the stairs, her feet leaving small, dark smears of blood with every single step. She wasn't crying, she wasn't wincing in pain. She was completely expressionless, as though what she'd done didn't even matter in the slightest. My grandmother froze as Marin reached the bottom of the stairs, holding up her feet. They were flayed, the skin and muscles sliced clean off, hanging off in ribbons. Deborah came running, her screams mingling with my grandmother's, but Marin just stood there, watching them, eyes cold and empty. Then, without warning, she began to sing again, that same Italian opera, the haunting tune filling up the room and making the walls almost seem to close in around them. Deborah scooped her up and rushed her to the hospital, leaving my grandmother just standing there, covered in blood. The sound of Marin's voice still echoing in my ears. My grandma went to do the only thing that she could think of, clean the blood from the stairs in the bathroom. It was everywhere, enough to fill a child, she said. When she got to the bathroom itself, she found Marin's skin and muscle arranged in this mosaic piece of art on the tile floor. Rumors said that Marin had sung that opera for 36 uninterrupted hours. And when they unwrapped her feet, those wounds were gone, as if they'd never been there at all. She now only spoke in Latin, refusing to acknowledge anyone unless they addressed her in that ancient tongue. While this was going on, Deborah received another call. Her husband's entire unit had gone missing during the skirmish and were considered MIA inside enemy territory. Again, she never relayed any of this information to Marin, but her behavior became even worse the second the phone rang. Everything with this little girl seemed to be directly affected by the war. When my grandmother was finally allowed to visit again, Marin was now in a coma, her little body motionless inside a hospital bed. Deborah now looked like a ghost, her hair matted, dark circles underneath her eyes, her hands shaking uncontrollably. She told my grandma everything, and the doctors were baffled, the nurses were terrified. They brought in priests, plural, to perform prayers, but nothing seemed to work. And it wasn't until Deborah received another phone call, this time telling her that Stephen, Marin's father, had been found alive. And that's when the girl finally stirred. When she awoke, she was back to normal, or at least that's what they wanted to believe. My grandmother never babysat for them again. Every time she saw Marin around town after that, the girl would just smile, a creepy knowing smile that sent shivers down my grandmother's spine. It was like Marin knew something, a secret, a terrible truth that nobody else could comprehend. Grandma Margaret believed there was something still dwelling inside that girl to the very day she died. For years, that family kept mostly to themselves. Stephen returned from the war, and life seemed to return to some semblance of normalcy, at least for them. But those rumors never ceased. People still talked about how Marin had grown quieter, more reserved, her strange abilities persisting. She would still predict things, things that made no sense for a child to know. My grandmother swore that Marin had a way of knowing when somebody was about to die. She'd make these offhanded comments that seemed like nonsense to people around her. But within days, whatever she mentioned would end up in an accident or worse. One summer afternoon, my grandma ran into Deborah at a local market. It had been a while since they even spoken, and my grandmother noticed right away how much older Deborah looked. Her once vibrant hair had dulled into a lifeless gray. Her face was etched with lines of worry and exhaustion. They exchanged pleasantries, but my grandma couldn't help but ask how Marin was doing. 
Deborah did not answer right away. Instead, she just stared off into the distance, her eyes glassy, as if she was searching for something just out of reach. She's fine, Deborah finally said, but her voice was hollow, lacking any real conviction. She's quiet now, but doesn't leave her room much. There was a long pause before she added, almost underneath her breath. Sometimes I think she's waiting for something. My grandma did not push the conversation any further. She said goodbye and left, but that encounter stuck with her for years after. The last time my grandmother said she saw Marin was a few years later, but by then the town had started to forget about those strange things. That all happened during the war, and most people were content to move on with their lives. But my grandma, she never forgot. One evening, she was walking home from the bakery, the sky darkening with the approach of a storm. As she passed the old church at the edge of town, she saw Marin sitting on the steps, staring out into the distance, her face pale and eyes wide. My grandmother said it didn't look like she'd aged a day since the incident at the hospital. Her hair was the same color. Her skin was still that same soft porcelain white. Her eyes, though, her eyes were different. They almost had this hollowness to them, a depth that no child should have. As my grandmother approached, Marin turned her head and slowly locked eyes with her. Hi, Margaret, she said. Do you ever dream? The questions sent a chill down my grandmother's spine. She stopped immediately in her tracks, pulse quickening. What do you mean? Do you close your eyes and see things that aren't there? Before my grandma could even respond, Marin stood up, dusted off her dress, and walked away, disappearing into the darkened streets without another word. My grandmother stood there for what felt like an eternity, with her mind racing, confusion, that old familiar dread lingering again. She said she never saw Marin again after that. Years later, when I was old enough to understand more about the story, my grandma said she looked into what happened to Marin and her family after that day. Apparently not long after this encounter, Stephen had had a terrible accident at the factory where he'd been working since the war. He was crushed beneath a piece of machinery, killed instantly. On the day that it happened, my grandma said she received a letter from Deborah, a hastily written note with trembling handwriting. In it, Deborah wrote that Marin had been acting strange all morning. She hadn't spoken a word, but sat by the window, staring at the sky and humming that same Italian opera song. When Deborah got the call about Stephen's death, she rushed upstairs to check on Marin, but, but when she opened up the door, the room was empty. Marin was gone. The window was open, the curtains billowing in the wind, and there was no sign of the girl. They searched the town, the woods, the nearby river, but never found her. It was as if she vanished into thin air. Some people thought she'd run away, while others whispered that something far darker had taken her, but nobody really ever knew. She never spoke about Marin again after that, but it was the weight of the story, the horrors that she witnessed, it had become far too much for her to bear. Every now and again, on those stormy nights when the wind howled and the lights flickered, I could see that same look in her eyes, that same fear, that same dread that haunted her for years and years. And even though she never said it aloud, I knew what she was thinking, that somewhere out there, Marin was still waiting, still watching, still smiling that terrible smile, like something else was living inside of her. Recently, I had quite a terrifying experience that I need help getting answers for. I never thought I'd be typing this up for an internet submission, but here we are. I wouldn't be wasting my time if this seriously didn't freak me out. I'm a 22-year-old guy in the UK from a small town in the middle of nowhere. When I say middle of nowhere, I mean the dead center of England. 
For those of you that live abroad, the dead center of England probably sounds like a happening place. It isn't though. Much of it is rural, with these small communities and rolling hillsides. I suffer really bad with anxiety and depression, which sometimes would lead to scenarios in my head or terrifying dreams. In the past three nights, I've had three things happen to me. Two dreams and one encounter. Before I begin my story though, I am going to say, I've always had this slight suspicion that skinwalkers, wendigos, and these so-called monsters are very real, and I've always had a really strong interest in all of them. But never would I have thought that I might encounter one especially living where I do. I know, at least to the lore, that skinwalkers and wendigos are native to the Americas. This perplexes me even more. So, what did I encounter? It all started this past Tuesday night. I got home from work around 3 p.m. and did my usual routine. I ate dinner, scrolled on my phone, and had a nap. I would wake up and hop onto my Xbox, talk to some friends. I think I came off my Xbox around 11.45 p.m. I brushed my teeth, had a glass of water, and then set my alarm for 5.25 and 5.30, ready for work. As I set those alarms, I had this sickening feeling in my stomach, the kind of feeling that something or someone was watching me. Now, this could be possible because of the layout of my room, so I'll explain it best that I can. In my bedroom, you walk in and the first thing that you see is my window. It's big enough for me to climb out of and stand on my roof. My roof is flat, as it's part of the extension that we have, so it's perfectly possible to get on top of it. I really, really felt like something was watching me through my window, through that slightest crack in my curtains. I built up the courage to pull them fully open and, of course, saw nothing. I just immediately blamed it on fatigue, shrugged it off. I fell asleep not long after. However, I woke up and heard my name being called repeatedly in this faint whisper. I got up and walked throughout my house with everybody else still asleep. This is very unusual behavior for me. So I decided to walk up my street. However, I noticed that my street was not getting any shorter in distance as I continued to walk it. Then that's when I realized that something was calling my name, calling it in my dreams. After what felt like weeks of walking down my 50 yard street, I began to see the end. The dream was allowing me to move towards this thing calling my name, which was now at a normal tone. Still faint, but louder. I could look around and see the rolling grasslands, the farmlands that stretched out forever. It almost felt like I was in limbo, like I'd fallen out of reality and into a place that should not exist. I walked to what would usually be a 10 minute jaunt to an old abandoned building that had always intrigued me while I grew up. Suddenly in this dream, I smelt this putrid smell, best described as decaying meat as I got closer to the building. The smell was so overwhelming, and then I could hear something literally screaming my name so loud that it was echoing in my head. As I walked across the building, I got to the door, and that's when my alarm went off. I woke up startled, wondering if I was actually awake or still asleep. When my dad saw me get up, I swear to you, he said, you look like you just seen a ghost. I went to work, albeit shaken up, but got on with the day. I got home from work that night around the same time, still wondering what on earth my dream was about and what it could possibly mean. As I was on Xbox talking to my friends, I explained to them my dream, and one of them said, that sounds like a skinwalker trying to communicate with you. This particular friend is American, so I know his cultural references aren't totally accurate to where I am. But after I did a little more research, it really did seem to line up. Now, I know they try to lure you in and stalk you, but never have I heard somebody say they try to communicate. At this point, I was terrified and just called it a night, much earlier than I usually did. I did my usual scroll, hygiened up, and then went to sleep. As I was falling asleep that night, that same feeling hit me, like I was being watched again. I glanced out my window and saw nothing once more, but I was a lot more aware now. This is where things get really weird and very real. Thinking about it now still makes me want to throw up every time. In this dream, the only thing I could move was my arms. 
and my name, you guessed it, was being called again and again in that tainted tone. This time it was saying, you must help me, please, over and over again. I heard scratching at my window, long scraping sounds like nails on a chalkboard. Then it started taunting me, chuckling, saying things like, won't you let me in? The only thing I could do was open up the curtain. I reluctantly used my arm to pull it open, literally the only part of my body that would still cooperate. And still, there was nothing out there. I could hear its voice saying the same stuff over and over again. It got so loud that I could see the glass reverberating from the vibration. Beyond the window, it looked like a tornado had touched down in the fields outside. My alarm went off and I woke up and ran downstairs, quickly splashing my face with water and got ready for work. That day was going slow and I could not take my mind off of everything that was going on at home. Every time somebody called my name, I would immediately start to sweat. I got home but decided maybe it was the hour long naps that I was taking that was probably and hopefully causing all of this. I know that sounds stupid but I was trying to rationalize it in any way I could. I actually stepped back and examined all my habits, energy drinks, caffeine levels, long TV hours, finances. There had to be something that was triggering my stress despite these levels. So I decided to switch it up. I was going to go on a walk, get some air. However, I thought I'd take the route that the dream was taking me in that first dream. Thinking about it now, it was absolutely the worst thing that I could have done in this situation. In the moment, I thought maybe walking the route with a little light and a clear head might be the perfect remedy for it all. Show myself that everything is normal, there's nothing to be afraid of. As I walked to that old abandoned house, I noticed it was very quiet for a nice evening that it was. One to two cars a minute. It was only 8 p.m., so I said, Huh, this is definitely weird. Usually, there's tons of cars drifting towards one town center or another families headed home from the city. Tonight, it seemed like it was just me in that building. As I got closer to the house, that same gut-wrenching smell hit me like a ton of bricks. And then I heard it, something actually saying my goddamn name. This was really happening. The building actually smelled like a corpse. That wasn't just from my dream. I stood there in disbelief, covering my nose and staring out into the dark glassless portals of those windows. The space inside was so black it almost seemed to move like a liquid. I felt the color drain from my face. I felt like my whole world was now turned upside down. I was in such a state of shock that I didn't even notice the rest of the features around me. A little garden leading up to the house, long, overgrown. Out back there were some more garden plots, some flower beds, and a few rows of trees like an orchard pretty much something of a little transplanted forest behind the structure itself. As I continued investigating the area, I saw two large green glowing eyes staring back at me, almost like two burning flames shooting straight through me. From a distance, I'd say maybe five feet tall, but I slowly watched as it grew to eight to ten feet tall, and rather quickly too. As I stepped out of that little wooden area, what I saw was completely unreal. A large deer looking figure, standing on its hind legs, staring daggers into me. It had half a face, half a skull, with pieces of flesh hanging on by threads. A large yellowing snout with saliva dripping from its mouth. It slowly moved its bony stiff arm with what should have been hooves, but instead had this humanoid hand and pointed at me. When it did this, I was so overwhelmed with those same voices that I've been hearing the last few days. Whispers, yelling, talking, people saying my name, people begging for help, people laughing and cackling. I heard accents that were new to me. I heard languages that I could not understand. It was like I was suddenly standing in a busy train station rather than a dark, empty plot of land. I've never run so fast in my life, and when I looked back, the creature was still there, slowly nestling itself back into the foliage, but still pointing one nasty finger at me. I got home, locked my door, and ran to my room. I closed my curtains and dove into bed. I'm typing this up a day after it happened, terrified of another dream or it being at my window tonight. I need opinions. What did I encounter? 
Was it playing mind games with me or did I just actually encounter a skinwalker? I also forgot to mention the name of the abandoned building, the Springfield Asylum. This was one of the first hospitals for the mentally unwell in the area, and it has century-long history of all kinds of awful treatment. I don't know if these things overlapped, but there's no doubt in my mind that they do. I've lived in this area for a long time, and I've never woken up to the sound of people whispering my name. It was a perfect night for a scare, or at least Pete and I had thought so. The kind of clear, full moon night that made the woods come alive with shadows and sounds of things rustling just out of sight. It was the fall of my senior year of high school, and Pete, my best friend since we were kids, had come up with this brilliant plan to mess with our younger siblings. I'll admit, the idea had appealed to me in the right way. Pete had two little brothers, twins actually, and I had my sisters both a few years younger than me. It was the perfect setup for a night of harmless fun, or at least that's how it started. The old schoolhouse was the center of it all. Pete and I had been there once on a field trip, maybe back in fourth or fifth grade. And even then, I remember thinking that that place was just eerie. It was historic, the first schoolhouse inside the state or something like that. It stood just outside of town down a highway and then about a mile and a half off this narrow dirt path that wound its way inside the woods. Even back then, I'd gotten the feeling that we were stepping into a place that had just been completely forgotten. It had been empty for years, but it stood back there, stubbornly clinging to the past, as if waiting for the students who would never come back. I don't know what it was that made Pete think about it again, but once he had the idea, there was just no going back. Let's take the kids out there and scare the hell out of them, he said. We'll tell them the place is haunted. Rig up something spooky in the trees and just watch them freak out. It'll be great. It sounded simple enough. We'd scoped out the place earlier that day, just to make sure it hadn't changed much since our last visit. The schoolhouse looked the same, maybe a little bit more weathered, but still standing. The windows were filthy, almost opaque with grime, and the roof itself sagged a little bit more than I remember. Pete and I poked around for a while, checking out the grounds and getting a feel for where we could hide the phantom that we planned to set up. A dummy made out with an old pair of jeans and a stuffed shirt hanging from a tree near the schoolhouse side entrance. Nothing too elaborate, just enough to freak out the little ones. And that's when we stumbled upon the cemetery. It wasn't much really, just a few stones scattered behind the schoolhouse, half hidden by the overgrown weeds and bushes. I had never remembered seeing it before, but Pete seemed as surprised as I was. The stones were old, the inscriptions worn down by years of rain and wind, but you could still barely make out the dates, all from the mid-1800s. Each one seemed to be a child's grave, names like Emily and Thomas, dates that ended far too soon. Pete stood there for a while, just staring at them before finally speaking up. Hey, he said like a true asshole. This will be perfect. We tell them these graves are the kids who died here. Say the whole school's cursed or something like that. Yeah, dude, uh, no shit, because maybe that looks to be half true. We both chuckled. I laughed it off at the time, but something about the idea was now unsettling me. Still, I didn't say anything. It was all part of the plan, right? We got everything set up and then went home to wait for nightfall. Pete picked me up just after dark. His brothers were already in the back seat, buzzing with excitement, and I had my sisters with me. They were skeptical, as if they always were when Pete and I had some kind of idea, but I could also tell that they were a little bit intrigued. That was part of the fun, was it not? The not knowing if this was just another one of our pranks, or if there was more to it. We told them the story as we drove. The schoolhouse, we said. It wasn't just an old building. It was haunted, cursed by the souls of the children who died there. Every year, kids would go missing in those woods, their bodies never to be found. 
Some said it was the spirits of the dead kids, looking for playmates to join them inside the afterlife. Others claimed it was something darker, something that had claimed the school long before it had ever been built. My sisters brushed it off, laughing nervously to themselves, but I could see the way their eyes darted to the windows, scanning the trees that lined that highway. Pete's brothers were a little quieter than they normally were, though they tried to put on a brave front. I'd like to say I was calm, but the truth is, the more we talked about it, the more I felt this creeping unease settle right over me. It was just a story, of course it was. But I'll admit there was something about that old schoolhouse that made it hard to shake the feeling that we were playing with something we didn't fully understand. Plus those graves really just gave me the creeps, because what were we messing with actually? There were real kids buried underneath those stones. When we pulled up to the trailhead, the parking lot was empty, just as we hoped for. Pete killed the engine. We all climbed out, the crisp autumn air biting at our skin. The moon was high and bright, casting long shadows across the ground, and the woods were black as night. I led the way, flashlight in hand. We started down the path and the kids right behind us. As we got closer, the schoolhouse came into view, its weathered walls looming out of the darkness like some forgotten relic. I felt my heart skip a beat when I looked upon it, a sense of deja vu washing over me. It looked just as it had in my memory, but now there was something more, something that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Pete and I exchanged a glance, but neither of us said a word. We had a job to do. We led the kids up to the building, spinning more stories about the ghosts of those dead children, how they were cursed to wander the woods, searching for anyone foolish enough to disturb their rest. I could see that my sisters were getting more uneasy, and Pete's brothers had gone completely quiet, their bravado slipping away with each step. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of movement inside the schoolhouse, a shadow quick and fleeting, like somebody passing by a window. I stopped dead in my tracks, my heart pounding inside my chest. Hey, did you see that? I whispered to Pete voice barely even audible. He looked at me frowning. See what? There's somebody in there, I said. I swear I just saw somebody. He grinned, clearly thinking I was now messing with him. All right, nice try though. But I was not joking. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end, a cold sweat breaking out on my skin. I shone my flashlight towards the window, but all I saw was the grimy glass distorted and warped. Maybe it was just a trick of the light, I told myself, but deep down I knew that was not it. We pressed on, leading the kids closer to the building. Pete was still in prank mode. He opened up the door and stepped inside. I followed him reluctantly, keeping my flashlight trained on the floor. The inside of the schoolhouse was just as I remember it, dusty, old, and filled with the scent of mildew. But there was something else now, something making my stomach turn. The air was now thick, heavy, almost like the building was holding its own breath. Pete was the first to see her. His flashlight swept across the room and for a split second we both saw the same thing. A pair of legs, thin, pale legs, gliding across the floor. It was just out of reach of the light too. She seemed to be wearing an old-fashioned dress, the kind that you'd see in those black and white photos from a hundred years ago, and then just as quickly as she appeared, she was gone. I froze, heart now hammering in my chest. Pete just stood there, his mouth agape, staring at the spot where she'd just been. The hell was that? He whispered. I couldn't answer. I was trying to make sense of what we'd just seen. It had to be part of the prank, right? But that didn't make any sense. Pete hadn't said anything about involving anybody else, and besides, there was no way somebody could move like that, no way somebody could vanish like that. In those clothes, it was almost like she was dressed like an old-timey school teacher. The kids started to get restless, sensing our fear now. Pete snapped out of it and motioned for everybody to head back outside. We practically sprinted out of the schoolhouse, my sisters and Pete's brothers right on our heels. I was about to suggest that we just get the hell out of here, 
when Pete stopped dead in his tracks. That dummy that we rigged up earlier, it was gone. In its place standing beneath the tree where we hung it was a man. He was tall, his face was hidden in shadow, but we could see his eyes, cold dark eyes that glinted in the moonlight. He didn't say a word, he just stood there, staring. And then he started to move. Run! I shouted, grabbing my sisters and pulling them toward the trees. Pete and his brothers were right behind us, but I could hear the man's footsteps, slow and deliberate, gaining on us. We tore through the woods, the branches slashing at our arms and our faces. I tried to keep my sisters close, but in the chaos, I lost sight of them. Panic surged through me. I spun around, desperate to find them. That's when they spilled out of the thicket, running just ahead of me. I zigzagged over and did my best to corral them towards the parking lot, but as we ran, something occurred to me. There were too many breaths, too many shadows, and as I looked them over, darting in and out of the trees, I realized that there was three little girls, now all running together. My heart skipped a beat. I had two sisters, but who was the third? She had pigtails, ribbons tied in her hair, and she was wearing a dress. A dress from another time, another century, just like the phantom woman that we saw inside the schoolhouse. Something was wrong, and it was just a few inches from me. I looked over the girl as she ran, and took note of that pale, placid skin, and the way her hair did not move at all as she ran. I reached out with my hand trembling, and touched her shoulder. She turned and almost shot up into the trees, disappearing into the shadows. I couldn't tell if she climbed or floated. All I know is she went up and then I couldn't see her anymore. Both my sisters looked up as this happened, so I know I'm not crazy. I stumbled back, totally shell-shocked. My sisters were beside me now, terrified but alive, urging me to keep going. We ran, not stopping until we reached the parking lot. Pete and his brothers were already there, laughing with Kevin and Samantha, who had apparently been in on the prank the whole time. They were some friends of ours from school and had been brought in on the prank itself. Pete decided at the last minute to get them involved and kept it a secret from me so I'd have a genuine reaction. Really get those kids scared, but God did it work. They'd set everything up. Kevin was the man in the woods and Samantha was the ghost in the schoolhouse. She even wore mom's old shoes and wool skirt. I can't deny it, they totally nailed it, but there was one thing still off that little girl that I saw. She was not part of the plan. We all laughed and palled around out there for a while before eventually hauling everybody off for home. The whole time I waited for them to mention that ghost girl, waiting for somebody's little punk sister to come strolling out of the trees, but they never did. That really freaked me out and scared me so much that I couldn't bring myself to mention it. It was one of the realest and strangest things to ever happen to me, and to share it out there it felt like I'd summoned it all again, and I didn't want that. To this day, I've never told Pete about her. I had to see her, and that was enough. <laughs>